Hello and welcome to Ignite with Mwangala with me Mwangala Chakalashi Santos. Winning in the midst of challenges or problems is what we're looking at today. Now, what do you do if you're faced with a life-threatening condition? Do you just give up or do you fight and emerge as a winner? My guest on the show today is Saruzai Changwe, who has been battling with cancer for the last close to 10 years now, and she's here to share her story with us. Saru, welcome to the show. Thank you. You look great. Thank you. And it's good I to have I you on the as great as I look. No, but I'm sure you feel great, don't I you? Do. I do. Okay. Yes. Now, Saru, I was reading through a memoir that you've written, a three-page memoir, where you entitled it Winning in the Midst of Problems. What exactly do you mean when you say winning in the midst of problems? So everybody battles something. It could be disease, it could be financial, uh, emotional. We all have something that we're battling. And um, as we grow in life, everybody meets a lot of obstacles along the way and some obstacles are much greater and more challenging than others. In my situation, it, my biggest obstacle has been the, the disease, the diagnosis of cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, like everybody else, our belief of cancer is that it's a death sentence. When you are told you have cancer, you just feel like your life has ended. I had never imagined to ever experience that feeling I had when I was told that I had cancer. Uh, it shocked me in ways that I, I can't to date comprehend with. Um, but what was important immediately was to realize that this is the situation I'm in and what do I do about it to help myself and also to appreciate more than complain. Mm. I think that's what has helped me more. Uh, you gain wisdom, a bit more compassion for yourself and for others, and that helps you get through those uh, obstacles, and that is exactly what I meant when I said, even if there was this big obstacle which I don't have too much control over, yeah. because it's there and it's not going anyway, I can just make it a little better, there's also a lot of great things that happened mm. along the way from 2013 to date. Mm. That is the statement of winning in the midst of Wow, obstacles. and you put it down so, so, so beautifully. Now, you talk about your journey there, how you were diagnosed with, uh, with, with cancer in 2013. Yes. Um, let's talk about your life prior to that. Did you ever think that you'd, this is something that you'd battle with? Not did you did you have any any signs? Did you know that there was there something wrong with you? Maybe let's pick it up from there. No, mm -hmm. I was perfectly fine. Yeah, I was very jumpy, uh -huh. very very outgoing. Um, I loved to have fun. Yeah, you know, um, very energetic, always ready to do this and that. Yeah, I was not a think twice person. Mm. I did not live a reckless life. I, I just led a normal life like everybody else. Yeah. So, yes, it, it was shocking. Um, I never imagined that my life would change overnight the way it did mm. in 2013. Were you having any pains before? So, yes, mm -hmm. so before 2013, 2013 is diagnosis time. Yeah. But the, uh, from 2010, I was battling with my health and I could feel that my body was no longer the same, yeah. but I just could not pinpoint. I did search for help. I was not the person who would uh, sit around and wonder. I did go for, to different hospitals. Yeah. Unfortunately, I did get the help that uh, I needed. Uh, I kept, you know, wrong diagnosis every now and then. Of course, when I'm being told, I don't know whether it's wrong diagnosis or not. It's mm. only after the actual diagnosis I realized that uh, I was getting wrong diagnosis and nobody was seeing what the problem was. So I had excruciating pain in my spine um, and it would come and go in the beginning. 
By 2012, though, it was not coming and going. End of 2012, it was just there. The pain wouldn't go. I had no peace. I could not sleep. I couldn't stand. Nothing made it better. Mm. Uh, the strongest painkillers, nothing made it better. I couldn't even make anybody understand what I was going through, not even the doctors, until I did the MRI, which uh, of course showed that I've got a tumor in the spine. Mm. And the reason we couldn't see it is because it was growing inward and not protruding outwards. So this was around the T6 area? The T6 area, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, apparently very delicate yeah. uh, area. So yes, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you go to the hospital and you're told that you have a few days to, uh, not to leave, but yeah. you cannot walk for a long time and yes. you had to go to India for, for specialty treatment. Was that easy of to just get not. up and go to India? No. Um, my husband is a civil servant. Yeah. I was working in the private sector and not really the biggest companies. I was really getting only so much. It was way out of the question in our house. It was not anything we imagined we could ever even afford, you know, let alone even just a private hospital within for any ailment. We couldn't afford that. So when people were saying your only option might be India, something I had never even dreamt of India, going to India, yeah. you know. So we were, we felt daunted. Mm. It was quite daunting. It was, we didn't know where to start. We didn't know where to start. But you and, had to start from somewhere. But we had to start from And you somewhere. managed to actually go to India. We did eventually manage to get to India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's because of our faith. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know that this is how it was going to unfold. Uh, we didn't realize, but yes, we, we prayed to be in the right place in the right time and for things to happen the way they're supposed to be. Wow. Yes, and we're happy that uh, the response has been as anybody else would ever oh, want it to be. Exactly. So you were in India for three months. Was it three yes. months or four months? The first time three uh -huh. months and the second time three months again. Uh -huh. yeah. Now during your journey you talk a lot about prayer and again um, this is something that you wrote in your memoir where you said uh, pray without limits. Yes. What do you mean by that? Because I think all of us pray, but for you, you went on to say, pray without limits. Prayer without mm. limit is that, you know, when you believe in an uh, object of devotion, yeah. uh, where you devote yourself to, mm. to prayer, often you sit and everybody has desires. Everybody has uh, dreams they want to achieve and we all pray about these things you know and there's also targeted prayers a prayer with a goal what are you praying for mm -hmm. you know uh, which is also good but then when I say when we say pray without limits mm -hmm. have a very open prayer so we chant uh, we are Buddhists and we chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo mm -hmm. and often you can have a list of your goals and achieve things that you want to achieve. But when you're being told to pray without limit, is do not specify and say, I want 20,000 kwacha. You will get 20,000 kwacha because no prayer goes unanswered. Yeah. So if you pray for specifically for something, you will get what you want. Mm. Meaning you are closing other options of the possibilities, the 3,000 possibilities that you, mm. everybody has a chance to. You know, you don't know everything. And you don't know, you can't see, sometimes, most of the time we can't see beyond. But if you open up that prayer mm. and just pray for things to be okay. Wow. Open without limitations. Without limitations for because sure. Because when you limit, you will get what you want. Mm. Exactly. Mm. I know that you're practicing rather a very uh, a unique faith. Uh, I like to call it un yes, unique. I understand. You know, uh, not a lot of people practice what you're practicing, and you've just talked about it today that you're, you, I mean, you're a Buddhist. How did you find yourself there? I met the practice through my now husband. He yeah. was a friend that time. His name is Patrick Changwe. Mm -hmm. uh, he had been practicing for some time, and um, so every time. When we were friends, 
every time we would try and connect and talk about issues and I would complain a lot about things, he always seemed to have the most calming, you know, um, guidance. Yeah. And it was always in reference to his practice. Mm. So I became very inquisitive about it. And in the beginning, it actually felt very harsh on me. Because when I started reading a lot about Buddhism and uh, I tried to chant, I started seeing me, the ugly side of me, mm. the good side of me. I started seeing myself very clearly. And I immediately realized that I'm beginning to know myself. And I wanted to continue because there's a part of my life I just wanted to erase to feel that I'm doing the right thing, mm. you know. And um, so that is how I met the practice. And I started attending meetings and they made so much sense to me because there was a lot of reason in Buddhism. There was a lot of uh, reality in it. It was really, really much daily life. Buddhism is daily life. Mm. That's what it was. and. That's what it is, actually, and that's what has kept me practicing. Wow. Okay. Now we take you back to um, to India, and you said, uh, let's talk about the. I mean, there are so many types of cancers, right? Yours is multiple. Multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So how intensive is that? Is that cancer? I know it attacks the the, the cells. Plasma cells yeah. yeah, the plasma cells. You know, it affects the, the your kidney, the bone marrow, or. Uh, when you were told that that's exact, that's what you had, what were your first reactions? I was in shock. Mm. I, I didn't understand why, how cancers come about, mm. um, why me, you know. Uh, you try and rush back through your life and try to understand, could there be something that I did wrong that has caused this? and. But I was very fortunate. I, I fell in the right hands yeah. when I was diagnosed. And um, when people get their diagnosis, it's very important that they meet the right practitioner, the right oncologist, mm. to make them immediately understand what they are in and what they need to do. Mm. That's the most crucial part. It's the beginning of the treatment. The counseling before that mm. is what's important. and. Uh, I was very fortunate to meet Dr. Rao in India. He made me understand it, the disease, how deadly it is, mm. and um, that it was not curable. But he also gave me a lot of hope. He said it's treatable. And a few years back, maybe now I can say something like maybe 20, 25 years back, mm. there was not much hope for multiple myeloma patients. A lot used to die because there, wasn't, there were not many options on, on, on treating it to maintain it. Uh, so people could be on treatment and they would die. But then there was this thing that had come up about the transplants, which was making it better, and the better medicines. So he gave me a lot of hope. He told me, he emphasized how it was not a death sentence. Mm. And I'm ever grateful I met him the time that I needed to. Yeah. I'm ever grateful. Um, he erased the fear from me immediately. Even as I was starting the treatment, I was ready to fight because that's what he taught me to do. Wow. Now you've talked about something that I think is very important and uh, I think earlier before the interview you were telling me how that people actually die not from the disease itself but sometimes it's from the stress, it's from the emotions. Let's talk about the emotions that you were going through the time you were told that this is what you have. And I want you to go through that for, for, for the benefit of the people that are watching us home because I know when you are told that you have cancer like you said it's a death sentence. How do you manage or how do you handle the emotions that comes with that news? Okay. Um, I always say, you know, these terminal illnesses, maybe not only cancer, but oh, we were speaking of cancer because that's what we, that's what I have. Yeah. Uh, they, they drain you in unimaginable ways. Mm. A lot of things that we often take for granted when we're not in the situation, 
like before I was sick, I never imagined like I'm saying. Mm. So it would drain you emotionally, it would drain you physically and financially, you know, um, mentally, it robs you. Yeah. And all that is taken away from you. You know, mm. your, your control over all these emotions, finances, um, physical being. In my case, after they removed the tumor, I was paralyzed. I was completely paralyzed, waist down. I couldn't walk. I had never imagined I would be paralyzed. Mm. I was born walking. And how long were you paralyzed? Par for? About eight months. For eight months? Yes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. for eight months. And um, so you're. You know, I had so many things I was fighting, trying to learn to walk. I had very little children, you know, who you are trying not to have them worry or have these bad memories of yeah. you, you know. But then you're thinking, you know what, this is it. Mm. And you're hoping that they they grow understanding it. And so my ch my children were my biggest worry. They were really small. The smaller one was two years old. The other one was seven years old. And no, she was nine. And that is what really used to hurt me the most. Every time I thought of them mm. or even imagined uh, that I don't make it, I just felt that they were really still really small. And of course, that's where my emotions were attacked the most. Mm. And uh, we had to make a lot of adjustments uh, financially schools and everything so everything was all too much and sometimes it takes time for people mm -hmm. to accept and make the adjustments immediately yeah but we had to be strong and sit down with my husband and say this is the situation we are in without adding much pressure on ourselves maybe we need to make these adjustments and we did and I think that has helped us a lot Hmm. And um, where the finances are concerned, everybody is challenged financially, but this case is very different uh, when you're sick. Yeah. You're on treatment, which is supposed to be for your whole life. Yeah. So the Zambian government, the Ministry of Health, of Health have been very helpful the past years, very, very supportive, um, except they've been having challenges. Hmm. So as of last year, uh, end of last year, they could not assist the way they've been assisting the past years. Um, so meaning we have to buy the medicine ourselves for those that can even try. But if you ask me, mm -hmm. it's all, it all sounds almost very impossible. I don't even know how I'm getting by. Uh, the past three months I didn't have medicine, but I'm fortunate to say that I did not relapse like I did the first time when I ran out of medicine. When I did my tests a few weeks ago, I found that I'm still in remission, mm -hmm. and I managed to get maybe for two months, but I yeah. don't know when I'm going to get for the next two months. The economy is biting so much, and uh, people are struggling. Mm -hmm. People who need medication every day, especially if it's for a lifetime, uh, you need a permanent solution. Yeah. yeah and for your medication, is a lifetime. Yes, it's medication. a lifetime. Yeah. And one needs a permanent solution mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and where do you draw your strength from? You told me um, that um, there was a time when you were really sick, that you actually prepared for your death. Yes. You prepared your family, you prepared your husband and your kids, so that uh, as you transition, you know, everything was in place. Yeah. How did you come to that place? Um, we believe that there are four things in life that you can't avoid regardless of what you believe in. Yeah. That's birth, sickness, aging, and death. Mm -hmm. And once you have that understanding that nobody's exempt from it, you're born, during your lifetime you become sick, you will age, and you yeah. will die. Mm -hmm. And some die earlier than others. Yeah. Everybody has got their own path. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize that these are facts of life that we cannot escape. And I think that's what just that keeps me going. And I have a favorite um, passage from the Buddhist teachings, which says, suffer what there is to suffer, mm -hmm. enjoy what there is to enjoy, and regard both joy and suffering as facts of life. Mm. 
that kept me going and still does. So mm. every time I'm going through something, I realize it's something that I need to go through for whatever reason. There's a reason for everything. Mm, I like that. You said suffer what suffer there, what is, there to is to suffer. suffer. Mm -hmm. Enjoy what there is to enjoy mm -hmm. and regard both joy and suffering as facts of life. And that's what they are. That's what it is. Is that why you were that. is that why you were comfortable? Yes. To prepare everybody to say now, you know, my time may come. Yes, so we were suffering yeah. differently. I was suffering physically, emotionally. With my family it was more emotion. The fear of losing me and everything. So I also had a job to try and make them feel as comfortable as yeah. they can through it. How long ago was that? That was uh, just when this journey started in 2013 yeah. and throughout, and we've all grown in it together, there's a time, the first five years were very fearful because mm -hmm. we were given that time frame um, when you're on chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Like maybe when you read a lot of stories, so the statistics have been like maybe between three to five years, whether or not you've done the transplant or not. But within those five years, you may make it, you may not make it. So those first five years were very scary. Mm. And the past two years have been very joyful for me. I, I celebrate every day yeah. with great appreciation. And uh, I'm just excited. I didn't even know I was going to celebrate my 40th birthday. Oh, wow. I am going to celebrate my 40th <laughs> when birthday. When is that? That's August. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so it's, that's just I mean, around, it was around, a, yeah. around, around the corner. So mm. uh, it means a lot to me. It really does. Every day counts for me. I there's many things we can talk about that I go through, but yeah. Um. Oh wow! I mean, um, you've just reminded all of us that we must not take life for granted. No, I mean, the very good. things that we think will be there tomorrow may not be True. there, especially when you are hit with 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 a life uh, threatening True. condition. It it just reminds you that we are not here to stay permanently. No. Now, looking back, what are some of the things that you've learned from, 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 from your challenge? Has it taught you anything? Yes, mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. Uh, patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my. Um, usually people say when we have children, we learn patience. Yeah. Not the patience you have to do when you have to nurse yourself. Ah. It becomes a job. Um, it's a daily job to take care of myself. Yeah. Literally, I, I have to know what I'm eating, mindful. I can't just eat anything that's there. Mm. I, I learn about this disease every, and solutions every day. And thank, thank goodness to, uh, to social media. Yeah. We learn a lot from it. I mm -hmm. love social media because it has helped me meet people in the same situation. I've joined groups, mm. uh, support groups that uh, you know, we exchange notes and teach yeah. one another what works and what doesn't and strengthen one another. We're all from different pe places and we're different people, different ages, you know, and um, I've learned patience the most. Um, when you can't walk anymore, when you can't rub your back anymore and you need to, when you can't pick something on the floor, no matter how simple it looks, and you have to ask, um, it humbles you, I must say, a lot. The situation humbles you because you, you become very needy and you don't want to feel like that. It's uh, very difficult to go through it, but when you accept it, you have a way you will talk to people and they'll understand it. Yeah. And the worst part also is that when somebody is looking perfectly fine and you have to explain sometimes to people who don't know that you're not able to do A, B, C, D. So you learn to talk to people. I've learned to connect with people in different ways. I've learned to, if I, the way I'll connect with you, if I just tell you a few sentences, you probably, I know I'll look at you and I know that you understand. But there's some people who need to be explained to maybe a bit deeper and whatever. So you start learning this art of life, art of living with people. I think that's what I appreciate also. I've had to learn how to deal with individuals differently. And it's of great benefit, really. I've made many friends of wow. all backgrounds. Oh, yeah. wow. 
On the other side, we look at the kind of mindset that you need in times of trouble. Don't go away. To advertise on this program and enjoy amazing introductory rates, please call us on plus 260-211-290959 or plus 260-211-290912 or plus 260-953-538-000. Or send us an email at loyolazam at gmail.com. Welcome back. If you're joining us now, I am talking to Saru, who is just sharing her story. Uh, we're looking at winning in the midst of problems. She's battled with cancer from 2013, and today she talks about it with so much joy. Saru, you're looking forward to your fortieth birthday, which is in August. Yes. And if you look back 2013, I think fortieth birthday was far fetched. Far fetched. And here it is now. In a, is it a couple of months, three, four months to come? Now I'm let's in happy shock. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Happy shock. Yeah. Now let's talk about the mindset that, that you've had. Obviously, this is something that people at home that are watching us can learn from. What kind of a mindset did you have? to fight and to image a winner from the cancer that you, you're battling with now? I had a lot of help. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of support. Um, I have a friend I was introduced to by my sister, yes. my older sister. Her name is Mimi Lungu. Mm -hmm. She also battled a similar journey. And the day I heard her story, when she was trying to give me strength, I couldn't stop crying. Yeah. I was just in shock that a human being can go through that. Mm -hmm. You know, I to date every time I think of Mimi's story I almost break down. Yeah. I but when you meet this lady, mm -hmm. she's one of the happiest looking people. She just goes on with life and every time I hear her name or see her, mm -hmm. I smile. You know, she gave me strength immediately, and I'm happy that I met her just before I started my treatment. Yeah. So she, she made me understand how important it was to quickly accept yeah. the situation. And that she made me know before I could even know the challenge of chemotherapy. Mm. Chemotherapy it destroys you. You'll never be the same. Ever. Mentally, physically, especially with chemotherapy, you'll never ever be the same. I'm happy that I met her because she told me I'll never be the same and I needed to connect with the new me. I had never heard of such a statement. So I started dealing with two people, I told myself. The me, me, and this new me, who I didn't know, because I don't know, I didn't know how I was going to handle things. I, each day I didn't know how the chemo was going to react, because it would react differently every other day. Um, it would break you so much, so much, you know. Some people even feel humiliated by the effects of chemo, because you just remain completely useless to yourself, you know, and sometimes no matter how much people are trying, it's like they're hitting a dead wall. But Mimi made me understand that it will get better. And you know, I was looking at Mimi, and mm. she's telling me this story about what she's gone through and everything. And yes, I'm seeing better when I look at her. And so she gave me a lot of hope. So every time I was going through chemo, I was just thinking of Mimi and that, you know, she's done it. She went through this rough patch and she's gone on with her life and it's so much better. So what gives strength is to accept and it's a very slow transition of getting to know this new you you don't know. 
and you have to deal with every day. So mm. it's like there's a new person inside you. So it's like you've got two split personalities. personalities. I don't yeah. know, even know if it's, since it's more physical, I don't know if I should call it personality, but it becomes personality because your mindset has to change. You're adjusting a lot of things. You're changing, you know, a lot of ways to eat, what to drink, where to go, uh, how long you can talk. Because mm. even talking drains you at a certain point. You get breathless, you get tired. You're always mindful about trying not to get an infection because that's the worst for chemo patients. So people who are going through chemo shouldn't get any infections at all. So you're always mindful, you're always watching your back. You know, every day, it's just on your mind. It's, it's stuck there, it doesn't go away. You wake up and that's all you're thinking of without even having to make an effort to do so because that's what it is. So you're battling that every day. So when I understood or I understand now what they mean when they say battling this, or mm. fighting, fighting a disease, fighting malaria, fighting diabetes, fighting cancer, it is really a fight. Mm. It's war, actually, war within your body. And um, what drains patients the most is that because your body is no longer the same physically, but your mind is still you. So your mind and your physical being are fighting and yeah. you can feel it. So these are the, one of the things that we take for granted and we don't realize the connection of how our body works. But when you're sick, you start feeling it. You start feeling where the muscle movement comes from. You start feeling the effort of you blinking where it's coming from. It's a whole different world. Hmm. And it's really a fight and it drains, it does drain. Wow. What are some of the worst uh, memories that you have with, with chemotherapy? Was it, yeah, was it, is it, was it in India? Was it back home here? Can you think of the worst memories that you can, you can ever think of? The worst memory through this battle was the time I was doing the transplant. Hmm. I've always never liked being alone. Yeah. And I was being told that I'm going to have to be in isolation for about a month. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't like that at all. That disturbed me, but it's something that I needed to do. And also, I never imagined that it would be so difficult to go through the transplant. Yeah. It was worse than the first operation, actually, where they were removing the tumor by far. Very different uh, scenario completely. I. I really battled in the, and I was alone most of the time. So you were 30 days in isolation? In isolation. Alone, totally? Totally. And then you go ahead now to do the, the, the transplant? So that was, so the transplant is not a one day, uh, it's a transition. Yeah. So they even call it from day one, they call it day one and whatever. So I'd understood that. I remember laughing with my, I didn't laugh, I was annoyed actually because, mm. uh, so there's a process, they're harvesting your cells and yeah. preparing you and whatever. So I was counting day one from the time they were harvesting the cells into day 30. Yeah. Not knowing that they count day one only three weeks later, that's after harvesting. Yeah. Um, so they're counting day one from the day they're actually doing the transplant, the actual transplant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but anyway, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so if I if I uh, following your story, um, this requires a lot of mental strength as well. It requires a lot of of prayer, like you rightfully put it in your memoir, that prayer without limits. What kept you going, especially for the thirty days that you were in, in isolation, in preparation for the for the transplant? So. I could not, I didn't have strength at all when I was doing the transplant, I was at my weakest, I was at my worst. I saw the worst that could happen to me. I, um, a lot of physical changes, mm. whether you're a woman or a man, I, I, I've seen men also battling. Believe me, men are always cutting bald head, but when the hair falls from chemo, yeah. It's a different kind of bald head, you know. You even feel the difference because the hair is coming right from the root. 
it affects everybody, whether you're a man or a woman. So the falling of the hair was not even the worst part. Um, I felt like I was looking at a rotting body because that's what it looked like. I looked in the mirror and I could, almost could not recognize myself. I, I discolored completely and that all happened in the first four days of, after the transplant. I was a different color of complexion. My teeth were loose. I thought they were going to fall off. Mm. I, I, they were really loose. Were uh, you prepared for that? Or no. you just saw all this happening? Were they you do taking through you, some counseling? Yes, you, you're mm -hmm. taking through some counseling every day, every day, but you'll never imagine it yeah. until you're going through it. You'll never, you'll never understand it until you go through it. Uh, I understood, even as it was up, oh yes, they did tell me this, but then it's so shocking because it's so much of it beyond your imagination, you know. Mm. And so the hair falls off uh, on all parts of your body, even the smallest hairs that we never really pay attention to. Yeah. I realized that they were not there anymore. I could feel it, you know. And um, the mouth, of course, the, the translitis is unbelievable. You can't eat. Your throat is literally closed up. Um, you have the frequent toilet visits, which I think weaken you a lot until a time when you can't even go to the toilet yourself. You need help for everything. So it was difficult because as much as I was trying to hold on to the faith and hope, I actually couldn't get myself to chant because I did not have the strength to, mm. to do so. I could do it in imagination, in my mind a little bit, but I could not. I could not talk, I could not chant. So that was the most difficult time. I'm, I was holding on to something that I can't even do at that time. Mm. But I just kept going. Wow, Saru, and here you are, you're a champion now. Let's, let's talk about, you're a winner for sure. I mean, there you are talking about what happened in the past. And the reason why I brought you on today's show is for you to encourage many people. I know there are so many people that are battling with cancer. It yes. may not be cancer as per se, but yes. different yes. ailments. Yeah. So the reason I brought you here today is for you to show some light for them, to light up their paths, if that's the right way of putting it. Because I know you've done it. I mean, you talk about it with so much joy, you know? <laughs> yeah, so what, 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 what is your message for them? What would you like to tell them? Like I said, suffer what there is to suffer, enjoy what there is to enjoy, mm -hmm. and regard both joy and suffering as facts of life. Because that's what life is. Wow. Life comes with its obstacles. Mm -hmm. Life always also comes with its great benefits. There's a lot more to appreciate than complain about. And when you appreciate, you gain wisdom, you gain compassion, and that's what is important. And everything else falls in place. That's all we ever need. It's all always been about love. Yeah. It's you have compassion in your life. You have com appreciation. Everything falls in place. Sounds simple and just, but that's the reality of life. Mm. Yeah. If you were on your deathbed, I know you can imagine it because I think you've been there so many, many times. times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So many times. Yeah. In 2018, I got an attack. Uh -huh. um, it was quite a fright. I was mm -hmm. admitted for pneumonia. And most oncologists do not want to hear that their patient has caught on to pneumonia. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. I remember my doctor, Moaba, here mm -hmm. telling me, hey, you gave us quite a fright. I was laughing with her that she didn't look it. Yeah. She says, well, I couldn't show you, but it was, you a, know, fright for them, it was yeah. a fright for mm. them. And um, I was scared. I was really scared. It's like, so even when people are talking about COVID now, mm. I feel like I've been there with the pneumonia, having the same symptoms. Yeah. I feel like I've been there. Mm. I've been in isolation. I've yeah. been... It's like just relieving it with everybody else now yeah. and maybe not in so much pain anymore, but 
it's a it's it's a transition time for everybody and i just like would like to encourage people that we always have to embrace these obstacles just as much as we embrace um winning situations yeah. victories and mm. whatever because that's that's life you know that is life true it's a reality of life let's just be realistic and we can move on and everything falls in place true yeah if you were on your deathbed and you're given a second chance to live, and I think you've been given second chances all the time, what would you do differently? Nothing. Mm. I wouldn't do anything differently. Life has been what it has to be for everybody. Everybody, like we discussed earlier, everybody has their path. Yeah. And nothing ever changes that. I believe in karma. Mm. I believe in the law of cause and effect. And there's nothing you can do about a cause that you have already made. Mm. Every cause has its effect. Mm. And that is why we always have to be mindful of the things that we do. Because you can't escape that. So you already made your causes in life. You, mm. you are already making a cause here. And an effect is going to come out of this. Mm. So there isn't much that I can say I would have done differently. Things were the way they were supposed to be. What is important, however, mm. is to live in the moment, be in the moment, be part of that moment, and make it right. That's all you can do. Well, what would you like to be remembered for? My compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your, com your compassion for all. That's all. Wow. Well, um, you've, you've taught me a lot today. I mean, I've learned quite a lot from you. Uh, we're supposed to ignite people's mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. We're supposed to leave a lasting and positive impact on people's lives. You've just done that for me. You've reminded me to be grateful every day because you know, tomorrow is not in my hands. The only, the only I have, the only day I have is now, is today. That's why we say present. Yes. So it you've taught me moment. to be in the present moment that and to appreciate everything. That's that. all you can do something about. You can't exactly. do something about tomorrow. Yeah. You can't do something about yesterday. Mm. You can't even do something about the way I woke up this morning. Yeah. But we can only do something about what we are in right now at this moment and that's all there is that's all there is nothing more to that and the only oh. other thing i'd like to say is that people must learn uh, to be compassionate that's why i'm emphasizing on compassion because sick people need compassion mm. a lot of support and what kills most patients i've come to learn is that most of the time you'll be surprised it's not even the sickness it's the stress they go through the fear, um, the worry, the dead end that seemed to be, you know, like maybe to say, wow, I can't even afford that medicine, meaning yeah. I'm going to die. Yeah. And then they worry a lot. Mm. They shift everything else to only worry about that medicine when really there's so much more out there. Exactly. Yeah. And you've just demonstrated that for yeah. us. There's really so much more out there. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. I'm I pray that one, two, three, even four people that have been watching us have been inspired by your story. I have been inspired. I hope so too. I have been changed. I don't think I'll look at life the same. Thank and I you. pray that it's, it's the same, same for, for most everyone people. Else. Yeah. And I wish you well. I mean, you're a fighter, and I know you're going to win. You've, you've, already, you've already won. We all are. It's very, very clear. When you're placed in this situation, you, you have you to win. You fight. And oh, wow. of course, you have to win. Fantastic. Yeah. So there you have it. Let's make every day count, because today, the present moment is all we have. Join me for another exciting episode. This has been Mwangala Chakalashi Santos on Ignite with Mangala. <laughs>